Okay, good morning. I'm Danny Sheridan, and welcome to the first two battalion chief. Uh, we're here live at FDIC at the uh, annual FDIC convention, and with me today, uh, we're going to do a little bit um, kind of something different today. All my battalion chiefs and all my chief friends that we're hoping to come on, we're all on planes right now, we're at the airport. So, but my plan B is a is a pretty good good plan B. So with me today, I'll even have uh, my two guests introduce themselves and I'll turn over to Ralph. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, uh, Ralph Fernandez, uh, 27 years, Lieutenant Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, uh, Platform 59, and also instructor for all international programs for Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Ralph. Danny, thanks for having me. I'm John Riker. I'm a uh, retired chief from the uh, city of Newark, New Jersey. I spent uh, 36 years on the job over there. And I'm happy to be here to support you, Danny, my good friend. You know I have 38, right? Whatever you got. <laughs> whatever you got is okay with me. Just um, keep paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we get started with the show, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor. The studio is brought to you by Firehouse Subs and the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation. Enjoy more subs, save more lives. Find out more about restaurant ownership at www.firehousesubfranchising.com. So, uh, yeah, welcome, guys. It's really, like, really an honor that you're here. Uh, you know, everything works out the way it's supposed to work out, right? And um, I want to take a quick moment to uh, just do a quick plug. I'm going to be uh, working with the Friends of Firefighters in New York City. And uh, one of the chiefs that I want, wanted to be on today, Walter Lewis from Orlando, had to get back to Orlando because they had a, a situation in Orlando where they lost a firefighter. Yes. And uh, the... A uh, bike ride that I'm doing in Ireland with a, a group of uh, FDNY Irish firefighters is to support the Friends of Firefighters in uh, FDNY. It's a nonprofit separate from the FDNY, but they help uh, counsel for free, not a charge. They give PTSD, marriage counseling, any kind of counseling. Uh, they do acupuncture, and they're super busy. Nancy Carbone has done an incredible job after 9-11 uh, helping out the FDNY. So I'm going to put my support into her. So if you're interested, uh, you could look up on uh, the internet, uh, Friends of Firefighters. So I just wanted to do that quick plug. And uh, we'll get into the show. So to start, I guess I'll do my own self-promotion, which I Go don't really it. do. But I see you got my book. Um, so I wrote that book uh, at the bequest of Bobby Halton. Bobby encouraged me to write that book. Uh, I wound up writing 30 stories, kind of got narrowed down to about 11. But what I, I, I'm not sure if the title actually does the book service because it's called Fire Ground Discipline, or Fire Scene Discipline rather. And I wanted to call it something, I wanted to call it Parables from the Fire Ground. But the way you could look at that book, it, it's generally, when I looked at my notes, it was actually the first 10 stories that I wrote. And they were all when I was a firefighter in 17 truck and in about 41. There might be one lieutenant story in there. But the interesting, the, the kind of the, the motivation behind writing that was that I, I got involved in these, these 11 stories where they could very easily be NIOSH reports. You know, two of the fires, I think two of the first fires in there involved a flesh rover. One of them was very similar to uh, something that happened in Boston on the Beacon and one in Cherry, uh, Cherry uh, Hill, uh, Jersey, I think, uh, where there was a flow path, a ventilation problem. Another one, uh, one of the stories has to do with uh, improper ventilation in a high rise. Someone popped out a bunch of windows and we were stuck on the wrong side. There's a few collapses in there. Um, there's a, you know, flashover, uh, collapse, there's also uh, some backdraft stuff, you know, so it's really meant, you know, for the reader to read it and hopefully that, you know, if you're ever in that situation, that you recognize the signs like, well, Danny Sheridan was in this spot. Like there's one instance there, uh, we had a firefighter fell off a roof and there was just, you know, it's one of these things where it was just a lack of communication. Uh, someone was new, didn't have a lot of experience. I put myself in a bad spot. I assumed I was complacent. I thought there was a real fire escape. There wasn't. So the book is generally about stories that 
more or less a lessons learned, a niosh that never happened. But it's not just a storybook, Danny, right? No. It's a book that if I read this, I'm going to get some knowledge out of it to prevent me from yeah. or, or my firefighters from getting in that bad situation. That that, so yeah. I'm actually going to learn something yeah. from this book, not just be uh, entertained, so to speak. Yeah. Like one of the stories where, where uh, one of the firefighters fell off the roof, he was brand new. Um, I... We were at a sequence. I went to the floor above, um, you know, and uh, I made a move. I went towards the rear, and there was no, I didn't do a proper size up. Had I done a proper size up, I would have realized that there was no rear fire escape. And only by the grace of God that I, I got back to the door. So there's a lot of that in that book. And I don't want to go on and on about the book because I really want to talk to you guys about what's going on with uh, what we're doing, you know? And um, <clears throat> so. I just want to bring everyone up to speed real quick. So I've been working in Ecuador since 9-11, right? I'll give you a story of how I got involved with South America. I created a group called Mutual Aid Americas and then it became Mutual Aid Training Group. And it was a nonprofit. And the idea was to send equipment training and bunker gear, whatever, and bring American firefighters down to South America to teach them kind of what we do here. And I'm, I'm smiling. I, I was looking at there's a bar over, over here on Meridian. It's called uh, Kilroy's. There's a Ford pumper right in front. That was the first truck that I sent down to Ecuador. So what it happened was it was after 9-11. A chief came up from Ecuador. I entertained him. He invited me to Ecuador, and that's how the story began. You know, and it's been going on for 23 years now. So... Um, you know, we've basically worked in Guayaquil, but then we started moving into Chile and Panama and Mexico, all, all over Latin America. And uh, that's when I got involved with Miami. I met one of your, uh, well, how many back now is uh, George Alvarez. It was actually the first person I met, captain in Miami. And then he introduced me to George and Juan and you. And so anyway, so uh, now uh, myself, Ralph, and John, we're just down in Ecuador in October. And uh, I'm going to, uh, Ralph, kind of bring us up to speed on what was the training all about? What did what was the, the takeaway from that training? Well, I think the biggest thing about their training is since uh, they operate in a mostly uh, volunteer status, uh, we kind of got to take care of them and adjust their tactics and such. And we pretty much got together and thought, yeah, for sure they need um, – Gratis placement and all that other uh, information because they really don't they don't really have a structure on the way they use it. But we thought that the transitional attack was going to be great for them because of the fact that a lot of times they were making interiors and interior attacks very blind, not and not necessarily with what they needed, especially the GPM they needed. So we thought that you know they're volleys, we got to take care of them to a certain so to speak. Let's let's start teaching them the transitional attack. Let's make it safer for them to make entries and and, uh, and so forth. And I think that that was very big for them because they understood uh, how to do a proper transitional attack. I think it fits very well into the way they're laid out operationally. And uh, it might be a tactic that's going to save a few of their firemen down the line. And that was what that was what our goal was to make sure that their firemen were as safe as possible, especially the fact that they're mostly volunteers. So the history of how I started with Why It Kill was I would go down with no one spoke Spanish. We all spoke English, uh, guys from New York, guys from New, uh, up in New England. And we'd get translators and, uh, you know, we were trying to teach them the New York way. And uh, they were loving it. And the way they work is kind of like here in America. They'll have a driver and a, a firefighter. The idea in their mind was to get the rigs to the, to the scene. And then as the volleys, volunteers come in, backfill. And what happened, it was kind of really beautiful to see, was that we taught them so well that it came to the point where these guys were just doing it themselves. And the vol volunteers were showing up and they were like, well, <laughs> you know, there's nothing for us to do anymore, you know? So uh, that was like the crux of it. But when you're talking about the exterior water and the transitional attack, uh, we, we, we put our brains together. We all talked about it. And we thought that the thing that saves them in South America is their construction. Because everything is opened up, right? So we're not worried about 
these tight buildings where we could potentially have a, a flash over a backdraft or whatever. And it, you know, the buildings are sort of leaky and everything's concrete, you know, and they're showing up with two firefighters. And what I thought was beautiful is you did a great job with that uh, exterior attack and especially with the portable ladder uh, component to it, you know, where we put the portable up and then they work you know, with the four S's, right? The, the smooth bore, the straight stream, the steep angle and the sprinkler effect. And they, and like I said to John, I said, John, they're going to look at you like this is the gospel. And when you speak, the, the, the beautiful thing about the five fighters in Latin America is that when we talk to them, they listen and they actually do it, you know? So a week after we're home, I got a text from George, one of the five fighters down there, and I almost cried. It was like, it was textbook. They had a flyer and there he is with the line open in the street, the two guys, and they knocked down all the fire, you know? And the idea is to like kind of soften it up a little bit and then they can, they can move in. And I remember having this discussion with Bobby Halton because we, we would talk about this at length sometimes. And he made a great analogy. He said to me one time, he said, you know, Danny, it's like the, the, the Pacific when they had those uh, naval battles and they would soften up the islands first before they landed, you know? And I thought, well, this is perfect for these guys because the construction lends itself to this kind of tactic and uh, the manpower. So it was kind of perfect, you know? Um, John, I brought you down. I know you don't speak a word of Spanish. I was the, I was, uh, well, I was the gringo, right? You were the gringo. <laughs> but they make fun with, of me or great what? admiration. I mean, the way they looked at you was like you were like Babe Ruth, you know? And I matched you up with a, a young firefighter from New York, yes. uh, Kelvin. Yep. And great. I thought it was a great. So tell me what was going on at that other building with the well, tower. First of all, mentioned about the firefighters down there in the whole situation. I was blown away. I mean, I was very, very impressed. Those guys, they got guts. They do. Oh my God. They got guts. Yeah. I've and always said that. Their situations. Yeah. You mentioned the building construction. There was no window down there that didn't have gates and bars on it. No. There was a doorway that wasn't fortified locked. And let's face it, they were Narrow streets and very tight quarters. They had a. They started off on a bad foot in a lot of uh, a lot of those buildings. You couldn't hold those guys back with a with a, with a chain. They were young ho. Yeah. And I was really impressed with their attitudes and their willingness to learn. And like I said, they they got balls. Yeah. You know they got balls. I I, was, I've always I said that. Great. You know, one of the, the best compliments I've done. I, I've probably done maybe 30, 40 trainings down there in Ecuador and Chile. And and I mean this. I don't, I'm not saying it just to, to, to fill the, the room with words and space and, and be nice. And I tell them from my heart, there's guys down there that I say, listen, in my battalion, I would take you in heartbeat. Absolutely. I would put you in any one of my... Absolutely. My yeah, I so, couldn't agree more with you with that. Some of those guys, the way they were up to it, they said... They were just outstanding firefighters. You have to tip your hat to them. And uh, of course, you know, there's a difference between training and testing. So in the training phase, when we were showing them operations, we were showing them the positioning of the aerial ladders and the tower ladders and, and, and everything that was involved in well, my end, but your end as well, Ralphie. Uh, they just picked up on that. And you didn't have to tell them twice. You know, it was great. Uh, the attitudes and the attention that they gave you and uh everything was great with those guys I, I was thoroughly impressed it was it was great to be there i think in um i think we can all agree you know when you have a lengthy firefighter career here in the states and you're gonna have peaks and valleys you're gonna have peaks and valleys throughout your career as far as the level of motivation you work with these internationals you work with international firefighters that are primarily volunteer they they, and they have very low resources and you see their level of enthusiasm and how much they love the job. And for us, it kind of re-injects when we're on mm. this valley. It kind of re-injects. Right. Hey, you know, this is what it's all about. You know, this is what it's all about. And, and the fact that we can give them anything. You know, anything yeah. As you know, I mean, yeah. you saw, I, I couldn't stop. Um, I was. They were hanging on to every word you said. Yeah, but they. Pumped, I watched them. They pumped me up. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they wanted to go, go, go. And I wanted to just keep on going with it. Yeah. And. Uh, let's face it, the Ecuadorian heat. No, I know. Uh, it, it, was, it got to me a little bit. I mean, yeah. you know, you know I'm, I'm an old man. 
And so no, like, but that, listen, the knowledge but, uh, that you have is, is unmatched. You know, so like what you talk I tell you, I was I'm not saying this just to John, I know you a long time and I we all met out here at FDIC what right. ten years ago when I was doing force entry and you were doing your ladders in the same building. More than ten years ago. Yeah, and um I was so really impressed. I mean, because uh, when we started doing the roll drills, you know, and, and we were sending them in, when I saw the ladder placement and Kelvin up there, you know, teaching them with the bucket, removing victims from that building, it was like I was anywhere in America. It was just, it was like, and they, and just maybe a few days before that, they probably hadn't even touched that ladder. But to their credit, Ralphie just said it too. It was, it was not just the. I was responsible for the ladder truck stuff, responsible for the lines and the, and the other operations. We didn't have to tell them twice. They yeah. were right on the money, you know, because they paid attention. And like you say, Danny, they did hang on what we were saying. They they wanted to learn yeah. all to their credit. You know, you know, it just worked out. One well. of my proud, like, I, I have a lot of proud moments in my career. Like, you know, I have a great career with New York City, 38 years. I've been in busy companies. But... I go down to Ecuador, and uh, when I first went there, they didn't have anything. I mean, they're running around with sandals on. You look at their air packs. One guy might have one. One guy's got a bandana on. One guy's got a coat that doesn't fit. The gloves are like five sizes too big. The boots don't fit. But their heart was like, like their photo zone. <laughs> it was like in it, you know? Yeah. And like you, I would say things, and I was very careful about what I would say because I know they're listening, you know. And over the years, I got to learn a little bit of Spanish, so I got less and less away from, you know, having translators and whatnot. But, uh, you know, one of my proudest moments was many proud moments. One was um, they had a fire, and you met Montenero. He was uh, yes. the captain, and uh, I had sent down an aerial at him. And what had happened when they had a fire in a five-story tenement, just like New York, mixed construction. Yep. And I had told them, I said, if you're not making progress in 20 minutes, it's time to rethink what you're doing and maybe reevaluate and maybe it's time to back out. So this one guy, Ronaldo, they're in there, thing is rocking and rolling. And he says, hey, Sheridan said that, you know, 20 minutes, maybe we should rethink what we're doing. I think we better get out of here. It's getting bad. So they all left. They went down the stairs. And unfortunately, one guy went one way and then the rest went the other way. The building collapsed. The aerial ladder was up, saved this guy, George. He, he's still pretty beat up. You saw him, he still limps and yes. he's all beat up. But he, we thought he was dead. I was actually, uh, I don't know where I was when it happened. I think I was up in New Hampshire. We were doing a class up in New Hampshire and uh, we had heard what happened. But, I, you know, the fact that you know, I gave them that little bit of knowledge. They never, but it's a double-edged sword for me because they never would have been in there if I had never taught them. So for me, I get conflicted. Because, like I taught these guys to be aggressive because one of the chiefs one asked me, he said, why in New York do you have all these deaths for firemen? Like to them, it was unfathomable. Like why would a, why would a fireman die? Like, you know, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword now, right? You teach them to be aggressive. And then now they're inside, and now with that comes the possibility that that's why we teach them to be safe. So, the and just one of the proud moment I had was um, it was a culmination of a bunch of departments. It was like Woodstock, Vermont, it was New York, uh, Rockland Fire Academy, and it was another place, uh, Hampton, uh, uh, New Hampshire, whatever. They all donated this equipment. Okay, me and John went down and we did a force military class. John is unbelievable the force entry. He made props. He was teaching them how to pull locks and cut gates. I mean, it was just an amazing class. And like you said, every place in Ecuador or even South America, window bars, gates, Everywhere. you name it. So the chief calls me up. It's Palm Sunday. And he's practically crying. He goes, he goes Danny, he says, you're not going to believe this. He says, oh, we just had a fire and we pulled out three kids. And what had happened was the uh, the parents left the kids alone. That's what they do. They you know, have to go out and work or whatever they have to do. They leave the kids like you would leave your your animal, you know, your dog or your cat and leave enough food, whatever. And the kids were locked in the house. You know, and uh, They showed up with the 
rig that was donated, with the air packs that was donated, with the bunker gear, full of that force entry knowledge. They cut the gates, they went in, they put the fire out, and they rescued the three kids. It's a great story. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> So, um, yeah, very, the, the, those, and those stories, and they happen more often yeah. than what we know. Um, they, they, they mirror us, they mimic us, they watch, they watch yeah. what we do on social media, YouTube, and yeah. stuff like that. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. So we carry a lot of responsibility as instructors yes. when we do videos and when we do stuff, when we yeah. do stuff because we've got a building code and construction here in the United States. We're a lot better, but over there, it's all makes construction. It's whatever they have available, so we can't, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know. We hope that they don't take that for granted. And Ralph, you're a thousand percent correct because uh, one thing that really kind of disheartened me a little bit is that I spent so much energy. I brought guys down like, uh, Buck, you know, Buckeye and Bohack and all these New York guys, and we're teaching them how to do engine ops and stretch a line and importance of the first line and interior smooth bore like just what we do in the up on the in the east coast you know and then this uh group of firefighters came in from you know because it was free training so they were grateful to have it for me. they were from a different country and they had a whole different concept of firefighting and uh there was a battle going on between the the sheridan loyalists and the the new like they thought it was the new great you know way to go like you know the, the best and the latest and the greatest and and i and this is why we're going to talk about this more is that like you know we really know their construction we know we know everything about them I'm, i've been there so many times i i just i know how south america works you know and um and i know what works for them and using the tactic that it just doesn't work for them you know and uh i don't know whether you know the ones that were loyal to me, it was really the paid guys. And they're the ones that do the brunt of the work anyway. And uh, they stuck with me. And, they, and the, the results are amazing. I mean, the growth. And, uh, and then we branched into other countries. And, um, you know, now we're working into Chile. And we're working on uh, bringing firefighters up from Chile to Miami. Correct. And you guys, we did a few in Miami. We did... Um, we did a f like five years worth of classes in New Hampshire, and that was a beautiful program. What we would do is we would get handpicked, they would handpick like a dozen Ecuadorian firefighters, you know. And they actually sent a few of the paid guys up too, which I was shocked because after like the third time, they started sending some of the paid guys up. And the Concord New Hampshire uh, Fire Academy gave us carte blanche. Um, and, um, you know, that was like uh, going to uh, Disney World for those guys. Like going to New Hampshire was like a badge of honor, you know. And then the, the idea was that they would bring back what they learned and spread it around to the, the firefighters down there. Um, you know, New Hampshire was tough from South America. But Miami, um, like the gateway to Latin America, and Nick Morgado, unbelievable. I mean, I just love Nick. And uh, we did two two classes maybe in uh, Miami, and it worked out perfectly. I mean, you guys just embraced them yeah. like it was Uno Brasso. <laughs> you know, it's just a big hug. You know, they wrote on the rigs. Uh, sure, it was just great. And we're, we're looking to do it again in October. And uh, you know, hopefully, it's just keep growing this thing. I spoke to uh, you know fire engineering the up, and uh, what's going to probably happen is that they may. The word is May now. May someday uh, in the future. We don't know when, but they're looking for sponsors and um, they're looking for uh, partners that we may someday see some Latino, Spanish speaking hot classes here in uh, FDIC. And how amazing would that be? It can be to amazing. Bring them in. I've been walking the floor. We've all been walking the floor. How many different dialects are we hearing? I'm hearing Spanish. You know, Danny, everywhere. I was telling Ralphie earlier today about that. Ralphie gave me an idea for one of my uh, YouTube videos. Um, I have a posting on Facebook and YouTube or whatever. He gave me a great idea about uh, aerial operations and showing hand signals. So I got to give him credit. Yep. He's, he got no, he, he gave me the idea, that, but I did make the video, and I wound up taking that video and putting it into uh, you know my computer and 
changing it from English to Spanish. Right. And the response I got was off the chart. It yeah. was just fantastic. The likes and the followings and the, you know, the thank yous, you know, for the information and everything. And I think your idea about, you know, bringing it into a different language like that, spreading it worldwide, it's a home run. It's a home run. I want to, I want to. I'm and it's such an advantage to you and Ralphie because you guys, as you know, <laughs> I was I was the gringo guy, yeah. and you know everybody made fun of that, which was yeah. all great. But your advantage is that you could speak Spanish, you know, yeah. and you can get your points across. You didn't need to, I needed to translate it, you know, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah. But that you know, in, its, in itself, that was that was pretty cool too because yeah. it did um, it did take take the edge off. Everybody, everybody had a laugh about yeah. a lot of things. Listen, and, I, I brought and Rick I George. Was pretty good. I, I brought Rick was George good. down there, right? And he's supposed to be my Spanish-speaking expert, right? right? So we're in Cuenca, in Ecuador. And, uh, he's in the middle of his whatever dissertation, and uh, he just freezes. <laughs> he goes, he <laughs> looks at me, he goes, "Danny, how do you say Friday in Spanish?" <laughs> I said, "Rick, you're Cuban, man." <laughs> Viernes. And then I had another guy from New York. We were down in uh, we were in Peru. Maybe it was Chile. Chile. You know, this is funny for me. I think it was Chile. Santiago, maybe. And, um, you know, so I let him go up. I, I wanted to test him out a little bit. So I let him do a little lecture on roof ops or whatever like that. And, um, you know, so he keeps saying, like, roof up, right? He keeps saying, like, you know, he's saying perfect Spanish. And then he would say, roof up. And then they're all looking at him like, like what the hell? Like, what's a roof up? You know? So finally, I, I knew it would be like funny, you know. So I just stopped him. I said, hey, "Listen, it's techo, not roof up." <laughs> <laughs> so here's this like gringo telling him like they got a, the big. So of course his name became roof up, <laughs> you know. But we have so much fun with these guys, and they, they just it's it's such a pleasure to work with them because. They're so appreciative of it. It's like they're teaching the gospel. Like, could you imagine what it was like two thousand years ago when they they're hearing the gospel for the first time, and they look at you like you're, like you're the word, man. Like you know, like you're the. This is they look at you like this guy is the expert. Like you know, what he's saying. That's why you're right, Ralph. We have to be careful in 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 what we say, because um, you know, if they and that's the problem with these guys because on the internet now. There's so much information. They grab it. They get half a story, and then they it gets like the telephone. They get the story to this story, and then it gets totally changed. And that's why I'm very, I'm, first of all, I'm very like uh, protective of who I bring down. First of all, I want guys that are down, like especially I've now most, most of the instructors now of all Spanish speakers. Because I want I want it delivered in their language. I'll give you an example of how rough it was in the beginning so we had this little house one back at the firehouse station five hotel five right Cinco. and it became like our kind of fire academy for a while and another beautiful thing about these guys like i needed a standpipe prop and i told this guy i gave him the little dimensions that said i need a pipe with an out within like a half hour we went to some factory built in it was back and i had a standpipe mm -hmm. prop, you know so we had this uh, little building it was an old little bodega like a little warehouse thing it was the size of like a, a 20 by 40 house, you know, it was all brick, you know, so I knew it was safe. And we called it like the Casa de Uma, right? The smokehouse. <laughs> so this is going to be like, now you got to picture these guys, like the, the gear doesn't fit, you know, they're, they're all like a foot taller, smaller than me, you know, and uh, they don't speak a word of English. I don't speak a word of Spanish. And my translator now has to be outside, right? So the idea is I light up. I light up a room, I get some pallets and hay or whatever, and I get a good fire going. You know, it's 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 toasty, you know. And uh, so we, we go in one or two rooms, and I got these three, three guys who were on the line, you know, and uh, they're all standing up, and they're starting to panic because they're feeling heat for the first This is like the first time any of these guys have ever been in a structural fire inside, you know. So... They're starting to panic a little bit now because they're starting to feel the heat a little bit. And I'm like, to them, this is like like crazy, right? Like we're in this inside this burning structure, right? So I don't know how to say 
get down in Spanish. <laughs> I'm trying to tell them to get down, like, you know? So, you know, in Spanish, if you speak louder, you know, it, it works better. <laughs> it's, I'm like, get down! Like, and I'm, I'm physically, like, you know, push pushing them down. And uh, finally, you know, I said, just open the, I didn't know how to say open the nozzle, nothing. So finally, we got through it. We got outside. I just went outside. I said, listen, I got to learn a few words here. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, I got to learn how to say, you know, open the nozzle or get down or whatever, you know. It was all growing pains. That's, that's, fun. that's yeah. exactly it. It's growing pains. You live and you learn. You become a better instructor and they get better quality. I feel, you, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head. I feel that when I started going down in 2002, that I became such a better fire officer, firefighter, instructor, everything. Because for me, I, I, I look at it as like a challenge. Like I say, I have to learn this language. I have to teach it, you know, and I got very good at like learning how to say certain things, like how to, I could teach how to force a door, how to, you know, deploy a hand line, how to open, do a search, whatever, you know, like, and it, it just made me focus more on being the instructor. Like for you guys that are native speakers, it's like, well, it's just, a, you know, I'm not doing it in English, I'm doing it in Spanish. You know? Sure. I mean, it, even still though, um, different parts of Central South America, the Caribbean, have a little bit different dialects. So the terminology changes. So you right. got to be pretty fluid with the terminology yeah. on which which area you're, you're teaching in. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they a lot of them come to the Miami area, yeah. it's, it's one of the reasons why we're able to be so open about learning their terminology. Because, listen, at the end of the day, they want to be an American firefighter for the day. You know, yeah. and and they're no different than us. When we travel, I'm sure you're the same way. When you travel and you see a firehouse somewhere abroad yeah. or something, you kind of look in. You're you're intrigued. Absolutely. As as you know, uh, geeks of the fire service, that's what we do. You know, yeah. and they're no different. And even even to the point where they idolize us. So you know, they're always looking in, and and wanting to come in. So you know, a few years back, we just started entertaining them as visitors because we we saw how much they wanted to just be an American firefighter for five minutes, sit inside of an American firehouse, maybe take a picture on a rig, something like that. Right. And just the fact that we did that, what it's done is it's opened, it's, a, it's built a lot of bridges for us, not to just send equipment and training there, but you know they want to come here, they want us to go over there, but you know we'd also like to see a lot more of them here at FDIC. Well, I think they would, they would be all over coming to FTIC if, if the opportunity existed. You know? you know, it's funny. You talk about different dialects, right? So when I was in Ecuador, you know, I, I learned, I started learning language. And, and the, the word for whole is Waco, you know? So now I'm in Chile and I'm giving a lecture and I'm talking about cutting a hole in a roof. And, you know, and I'm, I kept saying, you know, Waco. And all the students are laughing at me. <laughs> and I'm like, why are they laughing at me, man? I, and then... One of the guys says, well, I can't say it on the air, <laughs> but well, Waco is not a, it's, it's not really a preferred word. It's not an acceptable word. It doesn't way. mean hole in the roof. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like, you know, I'm trying the best I can. You know, like, I'm like trying to tread water. You know, and like, why are they laughing at me? You know, like I'm doing the best I can, you know? And uh, it's funny. It's just, it's, I, I tell you, I mean, in my career, I mean, just doing this stuff and meeting guys like Ralph and George and Juan and all these guys. I mean, and what I'm looking for actually uh, going forward, and I'm easy to get in touch with I mean, just on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. I, I don't use it a lot, but I, I did reopen it because now I have the book out and I, I kind of want to get that book out there. But I would let's, really let's do it again. Yeah, let's push it, man. <laughs> let's do it again. But what I'd like, uh, you know, I have my Miami guys, I have my New York guys, but, you know, I'm looking for instructors from all over the country that speak Spanish, but you know, they have to speak Spanish. You know, um, I want to be fluent. I had this one guy, he's a, he's a hot instructor here and he's got a Latino name, you know, um, and Joey, and uh, I just assumed he was a Spanish speaker. I was like, psyched. I was like, oh, you're, you're coming, he's from Jersey, you know, and I'm like, you're coming to meet Ecuador. And he's like, damn, I don't speak a word of Spanish. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, but, uh, we got some great instructors in Miami and New York, and uh, I want to find other instructors. You know, I want to get guys that, that want to travel. You know, to uh, well, this is the way to do it, right, Danny? I mean, right now we're broadcasting on the you know the FIC network. I'm sure there's you know a lot of people looking at you. Somebody's going to 
call and say, hey, you know, that's right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. I do speak Spanish. I'm in, into yeah. the fire service. I enjoy it. I respect what you do. I respect you and what you do and what, you know, your, your mission and goal. You're going to get calls. You know, that's one thing, how it works. And, and, you know, let me, let me also bring this up because what I thought was extremely dynamic was when we've gone together, you guys – are using your Northeast tactics, Northeast U.S. Right. tactics. And I and us in Miami, we're going to use our Southeast. You know, And what happens is over there, they're such jacks of all trades. They yeah. need everything. We need a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. I think the dynamic that you guys brought with your Northeastern tactics, ours with our Southeastern tactics and stuff. So if we got other instructors, some people about maybe West Coast, because we know based on construction and all that other stuff, they work a little different. Everybody works a little bit different. You know, we, absolutely. We can we can really hit all those benchmarks. And, you know, man, and what do we always say? Better. What do we always say? You need a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. Well, that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, by showing different ways to do certain things, when the time comes, if my way didn't work, they're going to go your way. Absolutely. And if that doesn't work, you know what? They have another option. Sure. Okay. So the bottom line is that they get it done. They're successful. They're safe. They get to go home at, you know, they want to go home just like we do after every call. And to do that, you have to have, you got to have more than one bullet in your gun. Sure. You know, just to get into the weeds a little bit, you know, like I, I won't even mention where it was, but there's a pervasive kind of mindset down there that like in a high rise, you know, I, I've worked in project New York City Housing Authority area for practically my whole career. It's farming 17 truck surrounded by 20-story high-rise tenant 58 engine done tons of project we call it projects you know like we yeah. do it the same way and you know and we do we we operate the way we do for a reason right because like buckeye says everything we've done is is written in blood right? we've had fatalities because we didn't do it the proper way we control ventilation you know we stretch um, from the floor below and we stretch in the attack stairway as and have another stairway for the evacuation. Like there's reasons why we do things like that, you know. And parts of South America, like some of the high rises have one stairway, you know. And I have to teach them, like, listen, you can't open that door and start moving down the hallway with people coming down the stairs, you know. So there's all these things, you know, that um, you know, we're not saying these things because we just want to hear ourselves talk. Like we're telling you this because this is how it works, you know, like. And one of the one of my biggest bones of contention was, you know, I, I was really good high rise fire, and uh, you know, I went up after it was all knocked down, and uh, you know, there was an inch and a half line with a, with a fog nozzle on it, you know, on the fire floor, hooked up on the fire floor, you know, and yeah, you can roll the dice and get away with things sometimes, but what, what if the windows fail? And it was like it happened in Rockaway where the windows fail, and now you. You know, you're on the five floor, right? Right. So there's reasons why we do things. You know, it's it's tried and tested. You know, uh, New York City, where since 1865, Newark, Miami, we've gone to thousands of fires. Right. And what doesn't work, we take out. What works, we keep. You know. You know, one thing about that too, Danny. You say you say it's tried and tested. Yes, it is. We've done that. We've done that for years, right? In all our career. I think an advantage to the training that you do is they don't have to try and test. No, they don't have to learn the hard way like we did. You know, they are getting it and it's already been, it's already been done. So and they have the faith in us and they're starting off on a good note. Uh, I, I know it's a funny way to compare it, but it's like, you know, these kids that the young kids today, they watch YouTube, they're playing uh, guitar set, and they're watching uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix play, and they're learning right from him. But right. Jimi Hendrix didn't have that. He learned note for note, right. you know, in, in yeah. a different way. So yeah. it's, you know, you see my comparison to that. So those are watching the New York City Fire Chiefs, Miami Bay Fire Department in operation. You guys, you guys already proved it, right. all right? And now they're getting it firsthand. And that's why they're good at it, because they didn't have to learn the hard way or do it wrong. They got it the right. They got well, it right from the. From the what do they, what do they say? So it, it's it's great to learn from your mistakes, 
it's better to learn from someone else's mistakes. You know, <laughs> I always felt that way. Like when I go down to Ecuador or Chile or Colombia or Panama, wherever, um, you know, that, um, you know, I'm giving them this stuff that I've done. Everything I teach, everything I teach, That's everything right. I talk about, I have done firsthand. Absolutely. I'm not teaching anything that you've done. You're not teaching anything that I have done. This is all, you know, I'm looking out the window right now. And I see a guy that, like, is Cubano that doesn't know how to say Friday in Spanish. <laughs> oh, that's, that's horrid. Yeah. <laughs> Unacceptable. <laughs> it's a <pure> yeah. <laughs> So, um, but so. yeah, we, you're, you're, you know, you're spot on. And, uh, and yes, we have, we, we, you know, we've had the experiences, we put them all together and what we're giving them has already been digested and done. And they, they, they do, they, you know, uh, one of the most beautiful things is taking what what we do and seeing how some of these uh, Central South American countries are putting in and, and building SOPs and SOGs based on the training that we've gone and given yeah. them in a week's time. So in a week's time. It, 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 and they're, now they are setting their own RIT program. They're setting up their own, uh, uh, they're, set, they're setting their, their, their own rehab. They're starting to get accountability down. They're starting to get uh, command and control, and then you're seeing it. All that's equating to quicker attack lines going in. They've got they they, they know we're still giving them a structure that they never really had because they just had volunteers just trickling from and Ralphie. They're safer for it, and they are 100. percent I'll have to say, let's say the truth be told. I don't, I'm not going to pull any punches here because one of the biggest problems I've seen in South America, especially in the early days. I don't know. If where we are with it right now, but it's 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 a lot of freelance, you know, and they're ahead of us in, in a sense in some ways because they they're great with social media, and if the fire happens, they, see they have kind of citywide some of these guys because they all have their cars and a fire breaks out on the other side of town, you know, they're free to get in their car and just go, and then I've seen it where, you know, I've been in the car with, with firefighters, you know, when we go into a fire and there's no reporting into a command post, it's just like Oh, and I said, I was in front of the command post today, and I said to the chief, I said, do you know what he is? And he had no idea. No, no, none at all. So what I, I'm thinking going forward in South America, and I want to try this when we go down in sure. June, is maybe I'll let you guys focus on the, uh, the engine, or whatever, whatever you're going to design. You, you design the class, the first 10 minutes, whatever you want to call it. But what I'd like to do is try to figure out a way with the firefighters that I'll stand there with the chief and say, listen, you don't know who's coming in, but why don't we create a command post and then let's have about 50 feet away, a staging area. And all the firefighters coming in have to, must report into that staging area. Now you're looking at the building, you have fire out the windows on two, two windows on the third floor. You need a hose team, you need a ventilation team, you need a ladder team, you need a RIT team, you need whatever you need. You call the staging area, and as they come in, you have a group leader and three firefighters reporting to the engine command post. Tell me you're going to the third floor, you've got the first line, and then go from there. And let's try to bring some organization. Because for us, listen, the way I look at New York City, Newark, Miami, we're kind of pre-staged, right? I'm in my firehouse. I have an engine and a truck. I have 96 and 54. I got 73 and 48. They're all pre-staged. The box comes in. They're responding together. They're responding. I'm responding. Same in Miami. All your stations, Newark. We're all responding in. We've already been staged. You're the chief. I'm the chief. We're standing in front. We have our SOPs. First two engines team up. They get that first line going. The first truck's responsible for five floors. Second truck is responsible for the floor above. Maybe in Miami... You do it a little differently. The truck shows up. They might be an engine. They might be a truck. But at least there's some sort of system to it, you know? What do they have? They have two guys taking a truck to a scene and then a bunch of volunteers showing up at all given time. They've organized chaos. Organized <laughs> chaos, yeah. So like I think that's cats. the direction we're going to start. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to go, like, in the future – going in a few directions. I'm going to look at more as command and organizing the whole thing. And I'm going to let Ralph and George and those guys work on the tactics, the engine ops. And the, what you did with that, that portable ladder and that, that, that 
outside stream was just amazing. I was blown away by it. But you took what I had and you just made it better, you know. And yeah, um, yeah the training, uh, the training in uh, Ecuador. I mean, the first few days when we concentrated on the actual doing of the jobs, we didn't worry about fighting fires. We weren't lighting buildings up yet, or worried about command and control. We were talking about the equipment and how it should be used and how everything should be organized. And they, those guys took that and put it together. And then when you came along as the chief of the operations to coordinate them, we didn't have to, I didn't have to worry about those guys. Are you putting the ladder up in the correct way? They knew how to do it. Yeah. So all they needed to do was to be coordinated. Like you said, you know, get that job done, get that job done. They knew how to do the job. And then you gave them the command, the control. Of it. I, th I thought it was a home run. One thing I like was, unlike here, like in America, right? So when we do training, I watched the UL video. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the guy's name. You know, of course, I can't remember his name. But, you know, we talk about training and live training and, and how that we never really could replicate training on the training ground like the real world. But in a sense, because the construction down there is all concrete and opened up, the training towers are very similar to the places these people live in. Yeah. So the fires that we were simulating, like we had, I guess, a few pallets and some hay or whatever. It really, they don't they don't have a lot of plastics down there. The old school, old type. Like when we came, well, when I came on a job, I don't know about you. When... <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there, man. When you came on a job, I don't know. <laughs> We were burning <laughs> stones. We were burning stones when I came on the job. I, well, hear, I hear you. The thing that I think is gonna is really working for us in some of these places that it's still very basic, you know. Yeah. And they don't have the the deal with the complex confined spaces yeah. and the the yeah. heat build up and the flesh over and all. That. It's like old school, you know. Like the fires grow for a while, you know, and you know, it's like put the wet stuff on the red stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. No, and, um, and and I think that that being said, you know, that's why we've done so much, especially also the lack of hydrants over there in their system and stuff like that. So, I mean, uh, we, we, we've got to teach based on sizing them up real well first. You know, and we uh, uh, want all the countries that, we, that we've had the pleasure of going to, uh, Danny and I, especially in Ecuador, we took a look, we took, it took that first couple of days and we were sizing up everywhere we went around because, we're looking at their construction, looking at, at, at the lack of hydrants and stuff like that, because we've got to lay down the tactics right. based on, on what they have. Right. You know? We saw what they had, and because we have some experience, we understood their problems right away. Yeah. You know, it wasn't hard to figure out by looking at some of those buildings that some of the difficulties that they would have. You know, so then when we got into our training, uh, we started to first we started with training. And then we ended with testing, which is really what you, you know, the, the progression you need to go. You can't test first. You want to train first, and then you test to see if they got it. I think everything went really well. It was so really, the uh, one thing, the really one good. thing that scares me the most over this is that they're so concerned about security. I mean, that's that's well, a real problem. Listen, that was places. a rough neighborhood. You know, I mean, and about security. You know, this whole idea of like people. Like it's in the Bronx too, and probably in Newark. I don't know how much is my baby in Miami, but I know in the Bronx. I mean, people are so focused on being safe and getting broken into that they disregard fire safety. Like my friend, Pete, my friend Pete McLaughlin was killed in a fire in October eighth of nineteen ninety five, and um, very dear friend of mine. We working a rescue floor. We worked together in, in Squad Forty One. It was top floor fire, and uh, you know he went in, and I guess the roof, whatever the roof was invented, the top floor was invented, and it was a. Uh, my impression of what happened was that the cockloft wasn't really vented. It was kind of the, maybe the the tarring sealed it, and so when he put his hook up, he introduced air into the cockloft. It just exploded. There was a um, padlock on the window gate. And that's everywhere in it. I mean, the padlocks, the, yes. the gates, the razor wire. I mean, so that's another one of my fears when we teach these firefighters to be aggressive is that I always tell them, like, 
we have to have second means of egress. We have to have escape routes. You know, like I taught this in my class yesterday. It's something that I want to maybe even bring down. I just, as I'm saying it, I'm bringing it up. I'm, I'm, I think we need to do this in South America. Is this like concept that I, I stole from the wildland where um, they don't do any operation until lease season in place, right? Lookouts, good communications, escape routes, and safety zones. And I think this is something that we need to maybe look at um, going forward in South America. Maybe someone, you know, the root team, safety team, whatever, because this could be a real problem. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. We have to do, we have to put safety first because if somebody gets hurt, you know, if somebody gets hurt, it takes everybody out of play. Not only that one guy, but now we're rescuing our own, we're attending to our own people. And let's face it, how many times you've been to a fire where you have enough guys? It doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen. And in in Ecuador, uh, I don't know, maybe the Maybe our audience really doesn't know, but they're all volunteer firefighters. They they hopefully come out of the woodwork, but there's no guarantee that they'll Absolutely. all show up, or in, or I should put it this way, there's no guarantee that enough of them will show up for a particular incident, and especially in a timely fashion. You you, you remember the traffic and and the driving through there. I mean, to get from one well, side of town every, to the other every was city, insane. Every city in South America. I was in Bogota. It took us an hour to get from like our hotel to the convention. It's an hour. It was just like, this traffic is insane. It's just, there's no, it's just a free fall. Um, Lima, I saw the same. Uh, Santiago, oh, even, it's, even it's, worse. It's all the same. And that's, that's why, uh, and, and that's why we can relate to them so well. I think we have such similar problems, and but we have more answers. You know, we have more answers. Hey, we have more resources here in the U.S., but we have more answers. And, you know, but still, you know, you see it time and time again. We're fires above grade here in the U.S., and, and we tell them internationally, working fires above grade, what are the ground ladders doing for you still on the rig? They're not doing anything for you. You know, get them out there. Get them out to the structure. Let's get it going. Let's do it proactively. And then just starting to give them that proactive approach, I think, has been very positive for us in, in the long You know, it's, 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 it's worked very well. So, you know, Clock is winding down. <laughs> uh, we're going to use every minute of what we have, though. Um, so going forward, uh, John, what, what do you? I know you've been retired for a while now, and I see at 3 a.m. on your shirt. Um, 3 a.m. innovations. It's to me, Danny. It's the future of the fire service. I say this all the time to people that come to our booth uh, here at the stadium. You're getting 3 a.m. innovations. You're getting the technology, whether you like it or not. I compare it to the cell phone. Years ago, when I remember the first cell phone coming out, I looked at it and said, what do I need this for? Right? Now, I'll drive back home after I, <laughs> I get on the highway. I'll turn around and go home because I forgot my cell phone. <laughs> right? right? It's the, that idea with the 3 a.m. 3 a.m. is a command and controlled software product that uh, keeps accountability of the firefighters. Safety first. We've been mentioning that all day. 3 a.m. goes on your computer. We all have computers in the rigs. We all have them in our chief's cars, right? And the chief has multiple ones on his desk, even in, in the office. With our command and control software, he can uh, keep accountability on his apparatus and his members. Plus, there are many, many, many other features of this uh, product that can, the bottom line is this, keep our guys safe. So you, know. you track the apparatus too. So like if I was at a box and I'm screaming now, I, I need, I need another truck. Right. You know, an 11 truck is on their way. Where are they? Could you, I, you, I can look on my screen and I can see where 11 truck is. I can know. Can the other companies see yes, where they the can. other companies are? Yes, they can. So they don't. And the, and the chief officer looks at that and he says, you know, normally my second do should be there in a minute. My second dude is out of service today. They're down in training right. academy. They're out of service. They're they're at a car right. fire somewhere. Right. All right. And he looks at that and he says, "Okay, now I got to adjust." Plus, the views, the uh, the street views, the uh, overhead views, allows commanders, not only chief officers, 
you know, the commanders in the fire uh, of the uh, you know, lieutenants and captains, I should say, to look at structures ahead of time and say, you know what? Can't put the aerial up there. Got too many wires and trees in front. Oh. You know, can't, can't put, uh, I might need an extra engine and truck. I got all gates and bars covering the entire building. Our software gives you that information and allows you to. Uh, so let's, let's suppose I, I, I'm thinking about a fire I had in a, in a, I had three warehouses and I had a big lot full of trucks that were totally involved. I needed a towel ladder in the rear and I needed a towel ladder in the front. Now, sometimes you get caught up in what you're doing, you know, you're getting you know, you're on the radio, and you, but you want my towel ladder to be on the, on the Charlie side. Could you, like, on the computer say, hey, Absolutely. this is where you're supposed to go? Absolutely. I could actually pinpoint. I could put it X marks the spot. Right? Well, there's no verbal communication. No. It's just like, boom, it's on the computer. It right. goes to them. This is where you're supposed to go. Right. With the 3 a.m. system, you can remove the confusion of a verbal command and put it in a picture or in a writing so there's no confusion. We all yeah. understand where X is right. when you look on a screen. But if I tell you go around to the seaside and operate, you have the seaside to operate on, right. right? I didn't want you in this window. I wanted you in the, that's, in the that's, fifth that's window amazing. down. Because I'll give you a real life story. So I was working in a truck company. It was a towel ladder. And I was a fireman in a towel ladder. So I'm very familiar how towel ladders work. We had row frames going. And uh, I called because we were responding on a second second alarm, I think, third alarm, whatever. And it was going. I mean, it was it was going, you know. And normally, the truck officer, you know, would say, you know, ladder so-and-so to the Bronx. Do you have any special instructions? Where do you want us? And at this particular fire, this dispatcher said, oh, let's report it to the command post. I thought that was odd. I was like, hmm, this don't sound like this is a towel ladder should be reporting in. They, they need the towel ladder right. because the side the bravo side they didn't have any protection you know so i got to the command post and i see the deputy and he's screaming at me now he's like he looked like uh you know like the mad scientist and he's screaming at me like, hey, 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 i want that beep, 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 towel that i bring it over to and we wasted like 10 minutes you know because all this like misinformation and you know like why didn't the dispatcher ask the deputy where, where he needs his towel ladder but you know with that it's like you know i'm, I'm at the command post oh uh, so-and-so truck is coming in want them right there yep that's wow. how it works that's the that's the technology and let's face it, it it's 2024 right. you almost right. you have to expect it so how can um how can people get in touch with 3 a.m it's just uh, 3 a.m innovations.com you know just Go on the website and and check it out. And you have a booth in the Lucas Oil. We're in the, right now we're in the command center in the Lucas Oil Stadium for for today and tomorrow, and we're also at booth twenty four hundred, I believe, uh, here in the. Oh, by Drake, I, I, so right by Drake Drake time. Yeah. yeah, right there. That's a good. That's a good spot. Yeah. So, uh, and Ralph, um, I see you have some Philly people with you, and you. Doing the, the kind of yeah, guy thing, bring them in, bring them in, just get them exposed, and hopefully we can build a more of a yeah. uh, Central South American uh, participation. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing you in May. 12th. I'm coming down to Miami. We're going to sit with Nick and uh, put this whole trip together for uh, Section 20th in uh, Chile. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to Ecuador in June. I That's correct, sir. Second week of Second June. Week June. Yeah. So again, if uh, anyone's out there that you know. Is, very confident Spanish speaker, and you work in a fire service. And you're interested in Danny. Can I can I plug my E Fire X people oh, real absolutely. quick? Yes. Everybody knows, especially you guys in New York and the big cities, lithium battery problems oh, yeah. that we're having. Terrible. It's sweeping the cut. It's sweeping the world. It's all around the world. Uh, e Fire X. It's a new um, chemical agent. Doesn't cause cancers, non-toxic, yeah. uh, no carcinogens that can be used to encapsulate uh, lithium batteries. It's a foam. It's, it's, a foam? it's not a foam. It's an encapsulating agent. Okay. It's used exactly like foam, and it's it is the future. So, if any, if anybody would please go on their uh, computer and look up E Fire X, I right. I think you'll be happy that you heard about this. 
Ralph, I want to thank you too for being here. Uh, Thanks for having me. What a pleasure. You are, you are Danny, my... congratulations to with thank this. Thank you, Leonard. Yes. We waited a long time for this. And uh, I hope you're able to know you, Danny. You've been a great friend. Likewise. Ralph is my mano derecha and uh, two o'clock at the uh, bookstore. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us.